There is nothing worse than untapped potential. If you know that you're made for more, this is the place. I know that every successful person I've ever met has one thing in common. They do not let themselves fall victim to their circumstances. They figure out a way to rise above it. So join me on this journey where I help you to be better, do better, and have better in life and in business. If you're feeling stuck and you're needing some practical tools, some hope to get you to that better life, this is definitely the place for you. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to the Unstuck Podcast. I'm your host, Lachelle Weemey, and today I get a chance to have a really, really inspirational and candid conversation with Zach Blackney. He is a, let me see, make sure I get this right, peak performance and business coach. So like really helping all of us level up. And Zach and I met a few weeks ago and we completely hit it off. And his story, you guys, is so inspirational. Not only what he's been through in his own life, but really how he has gotten to where he is and how he can help all of us get to where we want to be. So Zach, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Lachelle. It's an honor. Hey, and I'm just going to mention this, like you guys, Zach just got engaged. So I just think it's so amazing. Like, I just want to celebrate. Like, this is awesome, man. So thank you for, for showing up and I'm just, congratulations on this next journey of your life. So why don't you t- do a better job than I did to tell us a little bit about, you know, who you are and how you're helping people today? Yeah. So, you know, I help entrepreneurs, right, that are really looking to make uh, the impact and and achieve the vision that they want to achieve in the world. And one of the things that all entrepreneurs uh, deal with is this duality of wanting to achieve and also feeling as if they're worthy enough to do so. And yeah. worthiness is uh, something that we all deal with, right? Everybody on this planet uh, is going to be on a journey to prove in a way, trying to prove their worthiness through their accomplishments, through their relationships, uh, through their own mental complex of what they think about themselves. and. One of the things, uh, one of the main things that I do is I bring more of an inverse way of thinking. Uh, I call it uh, consciousness coaching in this way, Uh, because seeking to be better is the thing that blocks you from realizing that you are better. So Mm. when we're constantly seeking, right, I could even use a seeking, you know, validation or achievement prevents us from being validated for who we are in the present. Yeah, um, and it's, it's that uh, duality that becomes a major block for uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, because once we get attached to this idea that we have to achieve something to be something, yeah. we then start putting a lot of pressure and we put a lot of uh, fear, right? Fear sparks the pressure. Pressure creates the anxiety. Anxiety then uh, stimulates a lack of presence, right, in our present moment. And we know that the magic of everything that we create comes from an intention and being present with our intentions and aligning them with our actions on a daily basis. That is so powerful. And you guys, I don't know if I've spoken about this before in the podcast or not, but my you know journey of trying to prove my worthiness really did drive me in all of the education that I had. I mean, I literally went to school, got my master's, got my doctorate degree, got the title, got the job, all in order for me to kind of prove my worth, prove that I'm good enough for other people. And honestly, all it does is leave you empty, right? And it was like, when I started to really work on that wholeness, you start to decide that you want to be better from a place of wholeness and just to kind of see how far you can go versus a better from a place of trying to fill that hole. And I think that that is so powerful. And so many of us, because I can relate to that more than I care to admit, we can, we can benefit from this in one degree or another. So Zach, I think that what you're doing in this world is so important and how you're trying to show up and help people. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's hard because the, you know, social conditioning, social acceptance uh, inside of what is achievement, you know, is something that actually transforms a task list into a validation list, right? Mm -hmm. And that's not what it is, right? Those things are completely separate. If you take a task that you're doing during the day and then worthiness, they, there are two separate things, but our yeah. ego, our thought process will intertwine mm-hmm. those two together to have importance, but in all actuality, they're not. Um, yeah. We do the same thing with money and fear, right? So we feel like money you know, is unachievable when we have a fear around whether we're gonna make it or not. Well, you're the one that connected fear and money together, money and fear yes. are two separate things. You can make money and be fearful independently. You can also make money and not be fearful independently. Right. It's, it's, 
it's the synapses or I would say the synapses. It's the neurological connections that you make in your own mindset that mm -hmm. lead you to perceptions and beliefs that ultimately limit you from the thing that you want. 100%. And one of the things that I've heard recently that I thought was a really good analogy, I'm very much into just visualizing things because our brain actually works with pictures, you know, as you know that. Um, and so it, when you think about this neural pathway that we have, that programming, the, the bad negative thoughts or whatever, it's almost like water going over a rock. And over years and years and years, it creates this nice little dip inside the rock. It, it wears away the rock. And so it became comes a very natural place for that water to go. And that's oftentimes why we continue to repeat the same things over and over again. And it's really going to take effort and energy in order for us to divert that water. Right. But it's so worth it. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, over time, uh, I apologize. That's, I mean, just no, going no, no, no. over time. What I want to hear about this. Sure. I mean, so why I'm so passionate about doing what I'm doing and, um, yeah. You know, had everything to do with with creating what you call, you know, the rock and the water, or what I call grooves, yeah. right? Grooves in your yeah. brain that make uh, mm -hmm. thoughts very easy to fall into. Yeah. Um, and this process of neuroplasticity, right? Actually, being able to change these grooves. Uh, so for myself, you know, I was born in '86. I'm 35 now. So uh, when I was, you know, a young adult, I would say like 12, 13. You know, the internet was coming out, and we were going from AOL to uh, broadband, which was something that was huge. And also yeah. that time for myself as an adolescent and as an adolescent boy, the internet also had all sorts of new things you could explore, including pornography. Mm -hmm. um, so before we even knew what the uh, dangers were to your brain, to your thought process of video pornography specifically, um, I had already started mapping at a very young age, this uh, neurological connection, this uh, desire uh, mm -hmm. sexual desire, right, turned into an immediate uh, an immediate way of, of fulfilling that, right? So now yeah. we have uh, gratification that's coming immediately. Uh, then the ultimate, you know, feeling of ecstasy. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, feeling the guilt and the shame that comes with doing something like that. And I must have mapped that behavior over struggling with pornography addiction for 16 years, uh, tens of thousands of times. You're right. Um, and, and what that did over time is it, it created a false reality. It created a false way of looking at what um, sex was. Um, mm -hmm. It started to actually remap my physical body where there's something called porn induced erectile dysfunction that comes from watching pornography that consistently where your body, your new neurological chemistry is mapped to um, being able to perform for a computer screen. Mm -hmm and not necessarily for a person that you're in front of, right? A, a partner mm -hmm. in front of you. Yeah. Uh, so this happened to me over time, uh, as well as, you know, the unworthiness that comes with, you know, so the, the performance anxiety and actually not being able to uh, function of what I thought a normal male should be able to function in this space. And this was happening mm -hmm. to me in my college days, in my early 20s. Yeah. Um, so I took uh, this, this addiction and I chose to hide my, my addiction because of the shame. Mm -hmm. um, and something that I learned over time is, is that shame isn't a bad emotion. Shame is a signal. Um, shame is, shame is a, a light in the middle of the darkness that says, hey, you feel this way. You should come explore why you feel this way. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm 20 years old and there's something that the education system doesn't do very well, which is equipping you to deal with, um, you know, these type of challenges that you face in your life. Right. So. Uh, as I uh, got into my mid and late 20s and I turned into entrepreneurship, uh, started my own business, um, I found that, you know, this, again, tens of thousands of times doing something that had been forced, uh, that I had chosen, I would say chosen to put into my identity, um, had also created social anxiety. Um, it was creating, again, a feeling of unworthiness. If I couldn't be um, adept with, you know, my girlfriend and even at the time my, my ex-wife, um, then, you know, what kind of man was I, you know, I was incapable, right? So, and all these things start to bleed over into how you would run a business, how you would operate, yep. um, the actual vision that you have, you know, if, if, if having sex with a woman makes great, brings fear to you, well, so is stepping on stage in front of thousands of people. Right. And that was a part of the vision that I saw. Um, so the pornography addiction stimulated another addiction, which was drug addiction. 
And, you know, I had been smoking marijuana for a while now as a way to not think um, avoidance right inside of that. And then once I got with my ex-wife and I still had this pornography addiction, you know, the intensity was um, so much for me that I just I needed more. So I moved into the harder drugs, uh, to party drugs, to things that manufacture temporary happiness just for me to feel um, terrible, you know, for the next couple of days. And uh, once I got into that space, then my ex-wife, who, you know, again, I say ex, you know, newsflash, here's the, the end story, is that somebody that went from, um, you know, being totally in love with me to, you know, saying yes to a partnership for the rest of my life um, was not even attracted to me anymore and said that to me multiple times, didn't even know who I was. And in truth, I didn't know who I was. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the point, I guess you can say, where uh, we said that the awakening point came to a um, came to an experience, and I always tell people they ask me like, "Well, how did you have the courage to come out about your addiction to porn?" Because it's a very shameful addiction. Uh, you know, a lot a lot of addictions are, but there's a lot of weird things that go on in the taboo of porn. And I tell them I was like, it was forced out. You know, so it was we were leaving the gym, me and my ex wife one day, and we went into my truck, and she said, "I have something to talk to you about," and I was like, "What?" And she pulls out my phone and uh, she goes into the incognito mode, which, you know, any anybody who is uh, addicted to porn right now, I'm just letting you know that that doesn't hide your searches. Uh, I thought that it did. She pulled it up. And then obviously my 10 recent searches were on the phone. And she said, what is this? And I told her it wasn't me. It's right in front of me. Right. This is right. This is your phone. Who else did it be? It wasn't me. Um, I denied it three times. I denied it three times with it in my face. That's how far my denial was uh, before I actually came to the acceptance and admitting that it was me and it was a problem. And uh, from that point forward, you know, I spent the next nine months going to therapy and working on how to not do the habit. But what I did not, um, what I wasn't aware of was the patterns that were around the addiction, like lying and manipulating and controlling you know, these were actually hidden to me because of how much pride I had of getting over the habit of watching an addiction, but still not realizing that I was acting as an addict. And that was actually the moment that my ex-wife chose to leave altogether was nine months later when um, I didn't see, right, that I was still treating her in certain ways uh, in which she didn't want to be treated, right? Mm -hmm. So so once she left, that was the, uh, that was, that was the hardest part. So I, I guess, you know, I sat for about a month blaming her. I sat for about a month with the blame and complain of the, the victimhood and, and feeling like a victim of my life. And then I was uh, meditating one day and I just started picking up meditation and um, a voice came to me and that's the only way I can describe it. And it's what I call the inner guidance system now, but a voice came to me and it said, what would your life be like if you took responsibility for what you did? Mm -hmm. And then that turned like my perception, right? It's like, okay, if I can take all things from my responsibility, how can I make this better? Um, so then I just started learning as much as I could. I mean, I went on a tirade of, you know, borderline obsessed, borderline addicted to um, understanding the brain, understanding subconscious remapping, understanding um, different patterns of behavior, understanding the victim and saver archetype. Uh, then really getting into spirituality and understanding the or trying to do my best to to understand the truth of our experience so that I can live in a space where my perceptions are aligned with truths that actually serve my happiness and fulfillment. And this process took a couple of years. And then I really started to again, that worthiness started to come in. I had I had got to the point where I really loved myself. I got to the point where I felt really strongly about the strategies and the things that I was putting forward and I wanted to put them into practice. And once that happened, uh, you know, business started to organically and um, I say organically in a sense of just things were starting to come to me. And then once things started to come to me, this this law of attraction that we, we know to be real um, started to just cycle in very quickly. And then the business yeah. grew very fast from there. Because you were in flow, you were in alignment with what you were supposed to do. And I think that there's a couple of things that I wanted to point out about your story, because I think it's important. Number one is that no matter what background you have, no matter what you've done, no matter how many thousands of you know neural pathways have 
been, you know, created and gone over and over and over again, there's always hope, guys. There's always hope that things can turn around and they can get better. And then I also think that one of the things that I'm, you know, accustomed to do is to really look for the blessing or the the gift and everything, right? So even though you had a really awful 16 years of dealing with this and a loss of a marriage and and all of the pain and the turmoil that you had to go through inside of your heart and your mind and your in your soul it, through this process it all led you to where you are now oh, and yeah. you wouldn't be the person you are and you wouldn't be able to help the people you are if it hadn't been for all of the muck that you've had to go through and i think that you know if we find the gift in it it it, it helps doesn't it Oh, for sure. I mean, there was a, there was a few driving. So that meditation really hit me. And then there was a couple of more driving uh, statements that got me. Um, one was a question, like, how do I turn regret into gratitude? So how do you turn something you regret into something that you're grateful for? Uh, that, that answer was revealed through learning and understanding the lessons. And then also detaching myself from um, my ideas of what should be and mm. allowing to come in what is. Uh, yeah. So that was a big thing inside of there. And then the next thing that was a very, it was a very healing grounding statement. And also it motivated me simultaneously, which was that I was doing the best I could with the knowledge that I had. Yep. Um, so the recognition that even though it wasn't great, it was my best, uh, allowed me to start to release the regret and start to release the shit, what it should have, would have, could have. And mm -hmm. then the knowledge that I had motivated me to learn more because I said, if my best is only this, then my best can only be better the more that I learn and put into practice. So, you know, there was a lot during that time. And I remember about two years post the last time that I watched pornography, I started to really feel the, um, the emotional release um, of the, the healing aspect. They're really to the point where I could get to start to forgiving myself, really forgiving myself and not just saying it to the point where it hit deep enough in my soul that it started to release from my being. That's amazing. Oh my gosh, you guys. So, so Zach, what I want to do next is I want to go over really how in more in depth you were able to get from there to where you are now and how you can help all of us get from where we are to where we want to be. You guys, I'm going to just take a quick break. I'm going to tell you about what I am so stinking excited about. I've been working tirelessly on this because I want to help you literally live out the best life that you can live without having to give up all the things that are important to you. So stay tuned for that. And then Zach and I are going to continue this conversation in just a moment. Hey, Lachelle Weemy here, and I got to ask you, are you feeling like you're always on your freaking phone and you're trying to run your business, your family's complaining about you always being on your phone, you feel like you're winging it constantly, and all you want to do is have a strategy that lets you be 100% authentic and you are literally attracting the right people to you? Oh my goodness, that was me too. And I had to figure out a system that would make that work. I, and I totally nailed it. I have a program all designed to help you do that too, including a chance to spend the entire day with me so that I can help you write copy that attracts people and you will literally be done for an entire year. If that sounds like it's something that you need, we totally need to talk. Go ahead and click this link and let's get started. All right, Zach, so I want you to take us down this path of really where you were to where you are now. Give us all of the hope, the practical tools, the things that not only you did yourself, but the things that you train other people to do in order for them to move forward and get out of their own stuckness, per se. Sure. So there's a three-step process that I call three keys to speed. And this works for everything. Uh, from what I found, it's it's not only change, it's healing. Um, you know, it's, it's, hey, if I want to be a better uh, worker, productivity, uh, you know, performance-wise. Uh, and I call it basically acceptance, understanding, and forgiving. And, and it's these three that we move through uh, in different ways. So the first uh, process or the first step of acceptance is the hardest one um, because the this is the resistance point, right? In the same way that it took me three times to admit that I had an addiction with it right in my face, it's the resistance point that most people do not want to accept uh, their shame. Uh, again, I, like I said, about shame. Shame is just a, a, a light, right, in the middle of the darkness that says, hey, pay attention over here. You need, to, you need to pay attention to why you feel this way. But most people see that light and they, they don't see the light. They see it all as darkness. They see it as a resistance point. And the more they resist it, the more it persists. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, this is how right. patterns show up. The first time it shows up for you, the intensity is normally very little. Maybe you don't even notice that it's there. And then it mm -hmm. shows up again, and then there's a greater intensity. You'll think about it more. You'll feel a more, more emotional weight, and then you'll resist it, and it'll show up again with greater intensity and more emotional weight. All it's doing is trying to grab your attention to say, hey, pay attention, and you're not. Uh, so a right. lot of people live with this constant feeling of stress and anxiety because they're not uh, they're not accepting what they've been needing to accept. They're not dealing with what they need to deal with. So that's always the first step. Sometimes I have clients that come to me that think they're ready to uh, have better performance in their business. And then we dive into the fact that they're having relationship issues. They have an addiction pattern. They have all these different things that they're not actually relating to being the reason why they're not performing in their business. So that's really powerful. I think that one of the things I want to say that you brought up is like, it's almost like this light, right? That, that signifies that, Hey, there's something going on. You need to pay attention to this. And I mm -hmm. find that oftentimes when we have things that we don't want to face, we want to stay away from the light, right? Cause the light just makes it come out. We have to face it. We have to acknowledge mm -hmm. it. it. We have to see the things that we don't want to see and our ego mm -hmm. tries to protect us. Right. So this like, yeah, don't, you don't want to do that. But I love how you talked about how your intuition, the spirit, the, the true self is really speaking to you louder and louder and louder mm -hmm. until you're finally like, okay, fine. I need to acknowledge this. And you step into the light and actually that's when it's the healing starts. We we're so afraid of the light. But once we step into it and can actually acknowledge it and, and address it and, and look at it, it's actually the first step to healing. I love that, the way that you describe that. Well, again, it's the perception of that being a light. Most people don't perceive it. They see it as being the devil or something. You know what I mean? They yeah. see it as being something outside of them. And then that's just mm -hmm. a way of keeping them into a victim space. Uh, mm -hmm. The ego is tricky. Uh, I, I like to say something that you can be honest with yourself as a way to hide from the truth, right? So I deal with that a lot with entrepreneurs, especially because they'll tell me a story and 90% of the story is how great they're doing. And then 10% of the story is something that they are working through or something that's bothering them. And I'm like, well, that's the truth. I was like, and you're giving that 10% the weight that you should be giving 90%. That's the thing that's holding you back. As high achievers, we have uh, something inside of us that everybody has. I sit in the same duality now. We all have something that we wanna start that we haven't yet. We all have something that we want to let go of that we haven't yet. And we sit and think about that. And the longer we know we should start something and the longer we know we should let go of something and we don't, the more self-deprecation occurs. The more yes. we become insecure, the more we feel like we're not worthy, that we're not capable. Those things start coming in because uh, the intuition or like so I call the inner guidance system is telling us to yeah. do so. And we're not following yeah. it because fear yeah. takes over and prevents us from doing so. So once 100%. I can get them past the uh, resistance point and we can go to accepting that this is a thing that allows us to see it, you know, bring it to light, let's see it. And now let's go through the understanding process. And the understanding process is extracting a lesson, right? A lot of times we don't want to see it because we have a perception of it as being something that is hurting us when that's mm -hmm. not the case. They're, they're, what's there for us is something to learn and grow from. You know, suffering is uh, an interesting thing. We avoid it, but it also forces our consciousness to grow. Yep. We only learn through our experience. You right. Know, and that's something just to, ch to trace for a second. You were talking about like all the, the great, you make good grades in, in, in school and whatnot and all these different things, right? So we condition yeah. to believe that grades are the marker of success. But if you go back to when you were in, I don't know, preschool, there was this method called the gold star method. And the gold star method would give you a gold star for doing something nice. You share your store, your, your, your toys, gold star. Uh, you were nice to the teacher, gold star, right? It had nothing to do with grades. And that's mm -hmm. actually how you get graded in the business world. We get graded right. by our behaviors as an adult, not by what we make on a test. So the right. reason why I say that is because that's what creates this hiding is that we can sit behind that we're so smart and we know all these things and we all this stuff. That doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter what you know. It matters what you do. I love that. So, and yeah. Yeah. No, keep going. Keep going. I want to hear oh, more about what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So, so with that, it's, it's just bringing it back to the fact that, okay, once we can say, okay, here's what this is, the perception of it is that it is, it is hurting me, but in all actuality, if we extract the lesson, we find it, then we grow through the process, right? So if we can look at suffering as not being suffering, but as an opportunity to grow to the person we ultimately want to be, then we can meet challenges with a different perception. I challenges don't just because challenges and obstacles come up doesn't mean that they're uh, enjoyable. Like I don't enjoy right. challenges. <laughs> right, right. 
<laughs> but I do know that it would come, when it comes, the faster I'm willing to accept that it's here, the faster I move through the process, the faster I can understand why it's here. And then once I can understand why it's here, then I can start forgiving myself or forgiving others if that's the experience that needs to happen. So once we go I through the understanding that. process, we have to start looking at two things. One, who do you consciously intend to be? What do you want? Who do you want to be? Like, what is the goal? What is the thing that's calling you to be? Right? And where are you? And then from that process, realizing that there is a scientific method of subconscious remapping of you setting uh, what I did for myself, setting intentions, right? Every intentional act is a magical act. So if you can have an intention and set the intention on the mindset gap or the skill gap that you have, you are more likely to actually follow through what that is, right? It can be just as small as stopping a behavior pattern. It can be as big as getting over an addiction. Um, it just depends. So, but intention to me is the fuel that drives the mind in the direction of the soul, right? And if without it, then our mind is fickle. Our mind is uh, ever changing. We will have an impulse and an impulse and, and the soul has a desire and a desire and the impulse and desire creates inner conflict because the desire isn't strong enough to start and the impulse isn't strong enough to stop. So then we sit inside of this inner conflict with ourselves about what we should be doing. Well, to me, intention is the powerful thing, the magical thing that bypasses the conflict and goes straight to the mind. Oh, I intend to do this. I intend to be this person. So intention is something that's very powerful that most people, I find, say they have intention, but I'm talking about literally, why don't you write it down in a journal every single day? Mm -hmm. Oh, do you have a problem with, I always tell my clients, I'll change your life with a sticky note. They're like, how? I'm like, well, where are you finding yourself in anxiety and fear? Well, I'm finding it in uh, while I'm driving my car. Okay, cool. I want you to write your intention of empowerment, whatever we come up for you based off of your rhetoric, and you're going to tape it to your steering wheel. And every time you find yourself in conflict with yourself, you're going to look down and you say, no, I'm the powerful creator of my experience, whatever it is that we're going to do, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's about having these visual reminders because for me, going back to the subconscious pattern, tens of thousands of times, I can't even count how many times I mapped the desire, watching porn, ecstasy, guilt, shame, right? So many different times. And our subconscious mind becomes our predicator for our present, our present behavior, right? It's predicting what you want to do based off what you did in the past. Right. So in the beginning, you have to start being very intentional about this new behavior pattern that you want to start, conscious about it, and then realize that your subconscious mind, your inner critic, your ego is going to give you messages of why you can't, why you shouldn't, and why you won't. And now we have our new first phase of intention trumps that intention trumps that being in the present moment trumps that. If people that this is the shortcut to manifestation that I've just now started to experience. If you just set an intention and then be mm -hmm. present, the intention would happen. But you set an intention and then you doubt the intention, you doubt yourself, you doubt all the things that are coming through that process. A challenge comes up. It doubts that intention. You do all these things. Well, if you just set the intention you were present, you would have no opportunity to doubt yourself. You would only be present in the experience around you. And then that's actually what makes it happen, right? So it's inside of that space. It's like, okay, how can I pull somebody from a place in which they're in inner conflict, which in my opinion is the biggest time waster. It's not, it's not your phone. It's not a TV. It's not your friends. It's not a schedule of disruption. No, it's your mind that's distracting mm -hmm. you from being focused. So if we yep. can diminish inner conflict, then from diminishing inner conflict, you achieve something called singleness of thought, which is just the ability to listen to one voice and align with one, one, one voice. And then from that process forward, you are living inside of the present morning moment. You're living your intention. And then you step into this person that you feel called to be. And a lot of times that person only seems like he's one step away, but taking that step is so hard to do. Mm -hmm. You'll lift your toe and you'll put it down. You lift your heel, you'll put it down. You'll even lift your whole, your whole, your whole foot up. And you're going to yeah. step forward and then you'll doubt yourself from taking that step and you'll step right back in the same spot. Mm -hmm. All of that comes from your inability to realize that fear is just an illusion. And the closer we, and the more that we can realize that, the more that we can overcome it and the more we can live inside of love and compassion and truth, the more you're going to be present so that you don't think about all the things that are blocking you from that experience. Yeah. I find that that inner chatter is so prevalent and people that I talk to people that I interview in, in, in myself as well, where you have these, these goals, these intentions, but yeah, that inner conflict definitely wins in. Do you have any other advice for people that 
what they can do to try to, to minimize that inner, inner conflict, that inner chatter that gets in the way of the, the mindfulness. You have a choice. You can choose not to have inner conflict. Why, why do you choose to have it? Like that's, that's what we've um, really lost. I think in the, especially in society today, especially with everything that's going on with uh, coronavirus and um, news and how news influences us and social media influences us. It, it's, it's depowering us by taking away a choice. Most people don't realize you can choose to not have inner conflict. I could be in the middle of inner conflict and say, I choose not to have this right now. Why do I choose it? Because I know that it doesn't serve me and I know that it's not true. Right. Is this inner conflict empowering me? Is this inner conflict moving the needle forward? Am I taking action through this process? Then no, then I choose not to have it. So there's a, there's choice at every level that we have. Mm -hmm. It's our free will choice at every level that we can empower. And if we empower it, we realize that we are our choices and that our reality is what we make it to be. Yep. Then there's no room for victimhood. There's no 100%. room for, for anything other than responsibility for what we do. And that's how we start moving the needle forward. Um, that's the biggest thing that when clients come to me is they feel victimized by their experience, right? And mm -hmm. you can't be victimized by what you're creating, but they don't realize that just yet because the right. ego is what's creating the victimhood. hundred percent. And so you're right. We can choose our attitude and our action and we always have a choice. And mm -hmm. so when we have a choice, then we can't be a victim. We can mm -hmm. be a victor because we have the choice. And I love that. It's bringing the power back instead of giving up the power. And I think that that's where the anxiety, the chatter, all of the things come from is the, the feeling of, of helplessness or victimization. When if we step back and we realize that we have the choice right now, even if it's really, really hard, taking that, that step and choosing to not engage in that thought process, not engaging in that, that conflict is, is a huge, huge step on its own. Yeah, it's, it's hard to do because, again, if you've mapped, again, that you have inner conflict, then that's also something that you're mapping that's being predicted to be the next day. So if you're constantly in inner conflict, then your body's like, okay, cool, I guess you like being in inner conflict, so let's create conflict today and the next day and the next day and the next day mm -hmm. until you have the awareness to say, oh, I don't have to do this if I don't want to. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. But it's very hard to get to that point. There's, there's a lot of understanding that comes into play, and I give a lot of my clients shortcuts. I'm like, here's where you can get to. You can get to the point where you can set an intention and just be present. It can't happen overnight, only because you have to get to a certain level of understanding to, to get to that point. Now, it could right. be there was a miracle that was involved, and I believe in miracles. And a miracle can make that happen very quickly. Absolutely. But getting into that space and really starting to understand choice is, is mm -hmm. I think, one of the most beneficial things people can do these days. Because the problem is, is that we're too attached to our thoughts as being who we are. And right. your thoughts say no more than you than the freckle on your cheek, right? It's just yep. a thing. Your brain right. thinks involuntarily, just like your heart beats involuntarily. Yep. It's its job to think. So if we can realize, and there's something that Jim Carrey preaches, I love that he preaches it this way, because I've always said it, but I want to say it in his way, that like, I'm playing a character right now. Like Zach Blakeney is a character, right? And I don't need to play an, I, I, Jim Carrey played Ace Ventura and all these, those were characters. And then he realized that he's also a character. Mm -hmm. And it's the right. character that we create through our ego. So if we could just sit there and say, okay, um, my soul is the driver of a vehicle of the car. The ego is the fuel and the car is the body, right? Well, mm -hmm. why would we let something like the ego, which is just like fuel, it's just like water, it's ever changing, it's uh, shape shifting, it's doing all these things, mm -hmm. direct us. It couldn't. If you try to put water on the ground and say, go in one direction, it goes in 10 directions. That's what the mind does. Mm -hmm. Now, if you right. put it inside of a container, right, and then you have the driver of the vehicle being you, then the ego gets used for the purpose that it's used for, which is to create your reality through the intention of the soul, and the body will follow. But too many of us are inversed. Our body is in right. control. Our subconscious mind is in control. Our ego is in control. And mm -hmm. we're not free. True freedom Absolutely. is living life without judgment and concern. Once you can One do that, the there's a huge weight that's lifted. 100%. One of my favorite books is The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. I'm guessing mm. you've read it. but um, it's, So you would love it. But one of the things that he talks about is recognizing that we have our inner, our inner soul, our inner self. And it's like, okay, we can hear this like argument um, almost going on inside of our brains. Like, you should do this. No, you shouldn't. You should do this. No, you shouldn't. Who is listening to the argument? Mm -hmm. That's who our true self is. Yeah. 
Yeah, right. Uh, psychology calls it the observer, right? The observer. Yeah, right. right? your thoughts. Yeah. And so it's like, if we stop identifying ourselves as the victim, as who ego is trying to, to make us be, because they're just, the ego is just trying to keep us safe. Right. Mm-hmm. We identify as self ourselves as that, then we are going to be victims. But if we can take ourselves up and be an observer of it and make the choices that are consistent with, with who we truly are, right. <laughs> then we don't have to be the victims in that. And I love that. Yeah. Well, and a part of that is willing to is learning how to live in harmony with your ego or in harmony with your inner critic. You know, again, psychology talks mm-hmm. a lot about, you know, compassion, self-compassion. And and I, I'm, I'm with it. Like, I understand what that is. But also you, you have to understand why the ego exists before you can be compassionate with it. And one, if we didn't have an ego, we wouldn't be aware of our existence. Like uh, dogs that are not domesticated. I'll just use wolves, for example. Wolves don't have an mm-hmm. ego. They don't know where they exist. They, they aware that they exist inside of a pack. They survive, right? So, mm-hmm. okay, cool. That, that grants us the awareness that we exist. The other thing it grants us is it grants us uh, all of the challenge and obstacles that we experience. That's it. So without that, you wouldn't ever grow. So without your ego, you wouldn't be able to grow at all. So if we, if we keep vilifying it, inside mm-hmm. of our mind, right? And saying that, oh, it's my ego and my ego is bad and my ego is this and this, you're always going to be in conflict because that's what the ego wants you to do. The ego can't respond to love. It, it hits love and it, it, it gets, it gets, it's disoriented by love. It's like, I don't know how to respond to this. So it stops responding. Mm-hmm. I always use it to like an uh, analogy of a poker game. And this always hits home with a lot of entrepreneurs that I've talked to on stage as well. You know, if you sat down at a poker table and you knew all of the cards at the poker table, you knew all the hands of everybody else, you would win every single time. Mm -hmm. But to what end? You would win and you would win and you would win. And you might win trillions of dollars at that poker table. And eventually you would have no interest in doing it anymore because it would become boring. Mm -hmm. But that's what, for whatever reason, that's an an ego trick because the ego tricks us to believe that we want everything to be easy, right? That's not the case. We're not going to take it to that. The ego allows for the other cards to be uh, hidden to you so that you get to play the game. And yeah. Playing the game is what brings the fulfillment. I love that. And I want to make sure that we have given everything its full credit. So you had mentioned forgiveness as the third kind of thing that you talked about. Was there anything else that you wanted to say about forgiveness that we haven't had a chance to, to talk Ooh. about? Yeah, and forgiveness goes along with this compassion with the ego as well. But mm-hmm. um, a lot of people know how to forgive other people, but not themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and and the know-how is also repetitive. So where I was talking about the subconscious mirror mapping through the understanding, well, once you have the lesson, you need to be repetitive with the understanding. You need to create. You need to have your current past in which you're. I'm sorry, your current future in which you're conscious start to map into your recent past, which then becomes your later past, which then becomes a unified front of your subconscious and conscious mind. You have to do the same thing with forgiveness. Your brain is going to remind you of things. Hey, remember when you did that thing, especially traumatic things. And you have to mm-hmm. face it with, I understand what the lesson is and I've forgiven myself. I understand what the lesson is and I've forgiven myself. I understand what the lesson is and I've forgiven myself. And if you do that repetitively, then the subconscious or the ego stops because it's like, oh, okay, I believe you. I won't bother you anymore. That's what I relate that to. And the the way I relate this to other people as well, it's like, if I were to tell you that, uh, I don't know, I'm going to go do something, you might say, I bet you I'll see, I'll I'll believe when I see it. Like I'll say, I'm going to go jump off the Empire State Building and uh, parachute off, right? So I'm not going to die. And and my friend would say, I'll believe when I see it. I was like, well, cool. Your friend's brain works like your brain. You want to change? I'll believe when I see it. You want to change? I'll believe when I see it. So you have to keep showing up in consistency for yourself as well. And when you start showing up and get to see for yourself, then your brain stops bothering you. Just like your friend would stop bothering you once I jumped off the Empire State Building with a parachute. I told you so. I told you I was going to do that, right? So it's the same Absolutely. thing. As People have trouble forgiving themselves because they have to do it repetitively and they don't realize that it's a repetitive process mm-hmm. before they don't have to forgive themselves anymore. But it's just That's- in that same subconscious remapping space. That's amazing. And so I love that, that you've given us so much hope, honestly, on things that we can do to help our worthiness, to help the forgiveness, to get rid of the shame, to, to rise into our potential, just kind of bringing it back to the grooves that you mentioned when we first started chatting, right? And that repetition, that over and over again, that intentional thought, that intentional choice that we make can help to create the groove, solidify the groove, create the new path that 
our brain automatically goes towards, and that's where life changes. That's where life happens. That's where the new version of ourselves can be born. Absolutely. I love it. Oh my gosh. Okay. I literally could talk to you all day. Zach, we, we have um, so much, we have so much in common and I have so much I could learn from you. Um, so I just want to thank you so much for, for spending some time with us. Is there anything else that you haven't had a chance to mention that would really give people hope and practical tools to get them from where they are to where they want to be before we wrap up our conversation? Sure. I'll just offer them a perception. Um, and again, your choice, whoever's listening on whether you choose to adopt this perception, I'm not here to challenge your beliefs. I'm just here to give you something that empowers you. So if you look around at your life and everything that we have around us, you know, we can look at it and we can say that God created everything that we are, right? Uh, if we look at uh, something that is described by God as omnipresence, meaning that God is everywhere at the same time. If we look at some of the religious teachings, uh, let's say of Jesus or even Muhammad um, or Buddha, uh, they all say the same thing, that we're all children of God. So I'm waiting for us all to wake up to the realization that God is within you, that God is the inner guidance system that's inside of you, the Holy Spirit, the intuition, it's all God and that we are all God. And if you really choose to adopt this and believe this inside of you, you'll realize something, that you are cut from the same energy that created this entire universe that you see around you with the same creative power. And if you believe that, it doesn't matter how small you ever feel like you are, you never are. You're always a part of creation and you're always the powerful creator of your experience. And if you do that, you'll start to see your life be created in the way that you've always intended it to be. I love that. That is, that is very powerful. Zach, thank you so much. And one more thing, I always ask all of my guests to leave us with a coaching question, something that you would like the audience to ponder that's going to help them get from where they are to where they want to be. So the question, I guess the pondering would go back to their perception of their suffering. Everything that you say you want is on the other side of what your challenge is going through, right? So the, we, we go through this process where we see these, this person that we want to be and all the characteristics, um, but we discredit the fact that to acquire some of these characteristics or maybe to, a, to reveal is a better way to reveal some of these characteristics that we need our experience to teach us how to reveal them. So what I would say is, what are you resisting? What are you not stepping into? Because that's what you want. You just need to step into it. Oh, I love that so much. We're going to make sure you guys that you have all of the ways that you can connect with Zach inside the show notes so that you can follow him, you can connect with him. And I just got to thank you so much for, for showing up today, for, for being vulnerable, for being real, for being inspirational and really giving us the hope and the practical tools, honestly, to get us unstuck. So thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. Like I said, it was an honor. Awesome. All right. Bye everybody. Thank you so much for listening to the Untuck Podcast. I'm so grateful to be on this journey with you. And don't forget to check out the show notes if you want to get into my private club, The Better Club, to be able to learn better ways to be better, do better, and have better. So until next time, keep showing up. Let's get unstuck together. Have a great day.